I don't even know what I did messing around with this stuff. <clears throat> Good evening, people. I got all this stuff. I'm really trying something new because now I'm I'm running it without anything plugged up. I got a new set. I got a new setup, and I hope this work out good. I got a I got a new setup. This is good right here. Now I can run everything wirelessly. This is so I'm testing it out. God bless y'all. Anyway, uh, out there, those are the listeners out there. Hey, listen, I wanted to start off uh reading the scripture tonight uh, because there's just it's so many things that. God had on my mind, and uh, I wanted to start off reading the scripture tonight. It's uh, I'm coming from um, I'm coming from Romans, uh, chapter one, and I'm gonna begin at the twentieth verse, <clears throat> and it says, "For the invisible things of Him, from the creation of the world." are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and to, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness, uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies be- between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed and for ever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts one towards another, men with men, working that which is unseemingly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was met. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Uh, Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, miscellaneousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, Malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And I just want to read that scripture. Um, You know, I um, you know, I look in the world so much, and the things that are going on in the world. And um, right now, we live in a world that's just uh, we live in just a sensitive world. Meaning, you know, um. People just make whatever they want to and live according to what they want to. It's not even about uh, God and it's not even about um, it's not even about God's law anymore. 
it's just so many things going on in the world. It's not even about God's law anymore. It's about whatever somebody feel, and that's what's happening. And and the part that bothers me about all of this is so many minds of the people, and a lot of this has to do with leadership. So many minds of the people are destroyed, and the thing is, um, a lot of the leaders take a big part in this because, see, majority of the time when you go to church somewhere, uh, you know, believe it or not, being truthfully about it, God does speak to the man of God spiritually, but a lot of times the man of God ignores what the spirit is saying and they focus on what you want to hear. And the reason why I blame the leadership, because when it boils down to it, a lot of these preachers are just telling you what you want to hear so you can keep giving. So you can keep giving to them. You know, because when it really boils down to it, a lot of these preachers don't want the responsibility of having to pay the church bills on their own. And they know that if they preach what the Spirit of God is saying and the Spirit of God hits you and, 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 and the Word hits you, you're going to get mad and you're going to leave. And when you get mad and you leave, it's going to leave them in a financial toll. So therefore, they make you think that, oh, you're going to be blessed for not obeying God. You're going to be blessed in spite of, uh, regardless of what you do. God going to bless you anyway. So don't worry about it. Hang in there. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be the head and not the tail and all this. And you go throughout your whole week disobeying God not following none of his commandments and you go to church looking for the man of God to tell you that you're going to be blessed for that. And they tell you this because most of y'all are giving money. Let's just break it down and just tell you the truth about it. A lot of us are destroying our lives because we too wrapped up in our feelings and we don't want to focus on obeying God. I thought about this today. You know, most of the people that go to church and they just live in any kind of life and just wait for the man of God to tell them whatever they want to hear. You know what I thought about? If you giving, if you going to church twice a week faithfully, most likely, most likely, you probably giving about $20 a week, you as a person. Now, remember this. It's 52 weeks in a year. So if you do the math on that, if you just gave $20 a Sunday for a whole year, that's a thousand dollars. That's one person. Now imagine if you got fifty people doing that. Imagine if you got a hundred people doing that. And some people give more than that. Some people give more than that. Here you is going to church, the preacher telling you what you want to hear, and you give him money. And and at the end of the year, you still struggling. And then look, um, New Year's is about to come up, and everybody go to church and say, "This my year. This my year." You said that three years ago, and your year still hadn't came. It's a hustle. You understand what I'm saying? It's a hustle. And 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 
what I'm trying to get you what 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 I'm trying to get you to see is that man it's so many people that manipulate the minds you know listen people mean a lot of people mean well but and then when you start talking about the Bible I hear a lot of people say this is man made stuff it's man made religion they think God think like them. Like, if you really been reading the scriptures, you know, God don't think like us. Like, a lot of people think that when kids, I'm just referring to a, a, a certain situation, a lot of people think when a lot of these young people end up dead, uh, they think that there is no God because all of this is happening. If you read the scriptures, you will understand that God is God. Listen, when they when they when the kids were meddling, the prophet, they were calling him bald headed. Did you read what the scripture said? That God did. God had two she bears come out and kill them. This is the scripture. You know what I mean? And when Sod and listen, another thing, when Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, it was about five hundred thousand people. Fire and brimstone came from heaven. God destroyed that. Remember this. God flooded the earth. In the days of Noah, only uh, in the days of Noah. When they were trying to get on the boat, the scripture said that it was about 100,000 people out there. And the animals chased them off. Don't you know that when the earth was flooded, when God flooded the earth, only eight people got on the ark. Only eight people got on. Like, a lot of people don't know. God ain't nothing to play with. And the reason why we got have grace and mercy right now because God has given us the time and the opportunity to fix what we have wrong. But God ain't nothing to play with. You know, and let me tell you something. The scripture says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Listen, I have faults, and there are things that I've done that wasn't right. And I will yet probably make mistakes. You know, but I want to say this. Don't look at, well, I'm not, this is what I'm saying. Don't justify someone, let, let's just say uh, a, a preacher or me or anybody. Don't justify somebody that made a mistake to say, this is why I don't do it. I see a lot of people do this. They say, this is why I don't go to church now because of all these church folk, this and that. Well, listen. Rather, if you know it or not, you still wrong. Regardless of what reasoning you're choosing not to, you still physically wrong. Like, finding a good reason not to live right is not justifiable. You know, just because you choose not to live right because of you saw somebody else do something wrong, that don't mean that you are going to be justified for that. The scripture says that if the blind lead the blind, blind they both shall fall in the ditch. And I want to remind you of something. That's what happened in the beginning. In the beginning, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, the serpent talked to Eve and convinced her to eat the forbidden fruit from the tree, the forbidden tree.
the the fruit of the 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 serpent convinced Eve to eat of it. Even though she told the serpent, we not supposed to do it. But the scripture says that when she saw that it was pleasing to her eyesight and that she could gain something from it, she ate of the tree and she gave it to Adam for him to eat. Now, this is an important part that I want to bring up. Adam ate of the forbidden fruit, even though he knew God told him not to. Once he did it, the scripture says that the voice of the spirit of God was walking through the garden and called for Adam. They hid themselves because once they ate of the forbidden fruit, they realized that they were naked. And when they heard the spirit of God walking through the garden, they hid themselves. And God said, where are you? Why did you hide? They said, we are naked. He said, who told you you was naked? And then he began to say that he had ate of the forbidden fruit. This is what he did because this is what people do today. You know what he said? He said, what have God said? Why have you done this? You know what Adam said? The woman you gave me. She gave it to me. It was the woman you gave me. And then God asked her, Eve, what have you have done? Eve said, it was the devil. But you know what ended up happening? All three, the serpent, Eve, and Adam, all three was cursed and cast out. The point that I'm trying to make is even in the beginning of life, when something wrong happened, they blamed each other too in the beginning. But they all three were punished behind their choice. Disobeying God, they all three were punished. So what I'm saying is this, just because you may see somebody else that's wrong, that's doing something wrong, and they may legitimately be doing wrong, just make sure you ain't wrong because the thing is, they not going to be exempt from doing wrong, and neither are you. So don't always look at the fact that you see somebody doing something wrong, and that means that you going to give up and continue to do wrong because you you cursed when you doing wrong. And just because you see somebody wrong, it doesn't mean it gives you a legitimate excuse to do wrong. Um, uh, so I wanted to bring out that important fact because, you know, when it boils down to it, you know, that's really how it go. You know, we can't, um, there's so much going on in the world that even the scripture says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Like, it's never, it's not supposed to be going our way. And this is the one thing that I had to break down and really think about. And this is even in the scripture. The scripture says that Satan walked to and fro seeking whom he may devour. Believe it or not, a lot of times, every time something bad happens, you know what people say? Oh, the devil is busy. You know what? Even in the scripture, a lot of times, when bad things start occurring, really, God allowed bad things to happen in our life to separate us from what's wrong. Satan's job is to give you exactly what he know you desire. Because when he give you what he know you desire, 
It's going to keep you with your back turned to God. And this is this is one thing that people haven't realized, too. When you pray to God, Satan is listening, too. Because sometimes you think when certain things happen in your life, you thinking, oh, this got to be God. Because nobody else knew about it. Uh-uh-uh. Satan was listening. He's walking to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. So Satan is listening also. When you make requests unto God, Satan hear your prayers too. So therefore, what happens is Satan, Satan will find a way to get you exactly what you desire. And he make you think that it's God. Uh, if you don't believe me, the scripture says that the enemy come as a wolf in sheep clothing. Sheep is a representation of godliness. If a wolf has sheep clothing, that means he making himself look godly. He making himself look right from a distance. Listen, if you got a herd of sheep and the enemy and you got a wolf in the midst that have on sheep clothing, you are not going to notice the difference. It's going to look like the other sheep, right? Until he get close enough to get you. You see what I'm saying? When a sheep, when a wolf have sheep clothing, he get close enough where you don't see him. So with that being said, Satan's job is to convince us that what the devil is doing for us is godly. Look, how do you think Satan runs so rapid? How do you think the devil is so busy? Because people love what he's doing for them. He's busy because he's doing his job. He's busy and his job is to get you to disobey God. Maybe a million dollars will get you to disobey God. Maybe a new car, a new house. Maybe that man that you wanted. Maybe that woman that you wanted will make you turn your back on God. That promotion Maybe that certain opportunity will make you turn your back on God. When Satan knows that this will work, that's what he's going to get. You think about it. Why would Satan bring something to you that he know won't work on you? That just naturally does not make sense. Satan is going to use what he know will work on you. And when it works, you're going to be more in tune with what he gave you than obeying God. And it's not always about riches and glory, too, because there was a young ruler, in the, a rich young ruler in the Bible. And he came to Jesus and said, good master, what must I do? To inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus gave him the commandments. And. He said. The young ruler said to Jesus. These things have I done. From a youth. Up till now. What do I lack? In other words. He was basically saying. I've done this all my life. I've obeyed, I've obeyed, I've been good to people, I've done good things, I've done this all my life. What else do I got to do? I'm ready, basically. Then Jesus said, now if you want to be made perfect and have treasures in heaven, sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And the scripture says that the rich young ruler, ruler walked away sorrowful.
because he had many possessions. Jesus said, y'all look at this. It is easier for a camel to get through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So I said that to say this, having a bunch of riches and all that, that's not going to mean nothing either. Because the thing is, what good will your riches do? What good will your riches do? Listen, if you die right now, what do you own that will convince God to bring you into the kingdom of heaven? How much money you think it takes? How many material things you think it takes for you to have for God to allow you to come into the kingdom of heaven? You do realize, a lot of people don't realize this, but at some point we all are going to die. And none of this stuff we're working for, God, now is going to mean anything. None of it is going to be worth anything. So, when that happens, what are you going to do? What are you going to tell God? Are you going to do like Adam and Eve? When you get before God, are you going to say, Oh, that preacher, that boy, Diaris, DJ, he didn't live right, so I didn't live right neither. You think that's what you're going to tell God? And then he's going to let you into the kingdom of heaven because you told them. You told God that you saw me doing something wrong, so therefore you get a pass. It don't work like that. Even if you see me doing something wrong, and even if you right, that has nothing to do with your walk and your relationship and your commitment with God. Because, see, man look on the outside, but God look on the inside. He look at the heart and see, to you, I might be wrong. To you, I might be wrong, but God may not see it that way. So that's the reason why we can't focus on others and what they do. Listen, I read the scriptures from the, look, I read scriptures from the Bible, and you know what this world do now? Everybody holler. You're judging. Listen, if I read you a scripture out of the Bible, just because I physically said it does not mean that I'm judging. I'm reading you the word of God. It's not me that judge. It ain't the book of DJ. You know, it's not my Bible. I could care less what people do. Honest to God, truth, that's the truth. I could care less what a person do. You think I'm running around looking at somebody? Look, I wouldn't even, look, I'm in my own podcast studio right now broadcasting. I wouldn't be able to do that if I was worried, if I was running around judging what everybody else did. I'm too busy building something of my own to worry about what somebody else doing. All I do is read the scriptures. Most preachers don't preach that kind of stuff because they want you to keep coming. But it's in the scriptures. They just don't preach it because they want you to continue to keep coming and giving your money. That's why they don't preach it. But it's in the scripture. You know what I'm saying? A lot of things in the scripture that most preachers refuse to preach on because they're more worried about getting your pocketbook. They don't want to end up paying those church bills by themselves. You understand what I'm saying? They don't want to pay that electric bill out of their own pocket, so they tell you, God, I got a blessing for you, even though. You've been a hellhound all week. They're going to tell you that God going to bless you anyhow. And they're going to get you happy enough to give your money 
so it don't put them in a financial toll. I'm not getting nobody money. I'm just telling you what's written in the scripture. And I'm not worried about nobody uh, personally because, hey, look, you from from my point of view, for me, listen, I've been a liar, deceiver, a cheater, heartbreaker, all that kind of stuff that come out. I've done many things that were wrong. And I wasn't here. I didn't have what I have now. I wasn't doing this. I was on a mission for the devil. But when, and look, some, a lot of it I was doing going to church. But when God finally awakened me to the truth of God, the real truth of God that convicted my heart, that really got down in there, you know, I made my mind up to said, I'm going to tell the truth. I'm not going to be, uh, uh, I'm going to tell the truth. And God changed all of my circumstances. You know what I mean? I didn't even have a career. I didn't even have a strong career at first to be able to take care of myself and my family. But the scripture says, David said, I once was young, but now I'm old. But I've never seen a righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. Listen, righteous does not mean that you're not going to make mistakes. That, listen, David was a man after God's own heart. But it wasn't because he was perfect. What it was, was David, when he was wrong, he would fall on his knees and repent. He would get it right with God. That's what made him a, a man after God's own heart. David would get it right with God. And that's what matters. When you wrong, when you have the heart to repent and acknowledge where you wrong, that's what God can use. Most people cannot acknowledge that they wrong. When they wrong, they look for something else wrong in somebody else so they don't have to change what they're doing. But in reality, it's the Spirit of God that's trying to convict you to let you know, listen, it's time to make a change. It's time to make a change. If you're living like you're living now, imagine how it will be if you really got a hold to God and really cut that mess out, really let go. If God choose you out of the world, the scripture says, you are going to be hated just like they hated him. Remember, before we forget, Jesus Christ was crucified. And this was, a, this was someone that was perfect, that done no wrong, and was nailed to the cross. So listen, if Jesus was nailed to the cross for doing absolutely no wrong, what you think you going to go through when you are wrong, when you have faults against you? Because I do. We all do. So you got to expect the smoke to come with it because we all, we all have faults. So that's one thing we have to remember. Jesus Christ was crucified with no faults. And here we is without faults. So we're going to go through it whether if we want to or not. And that's just a part of it. But nevertheless, you know, hang in there. And listen, uh, I just want to also say this uh, real quick. You know, I'm, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. And some people have a way of trying to say that to me. Some people attack me personally because I say something that is true. And they try to take personal hits at me. Listen, uh, that's, that's all cool and fine and dandy. But I want to say this. If, if a family member of mine does something wrong, 
And it becomes your obligation to do something about that. If one of my family members do wrong, do something seriously wrong to somebody, don't sweep it under the rug and then fault me because they related to me. If if you know a person did you wrong and and it's a family member of mine, don't justify it with me. I don't condone none of that. I don't condone nothing that is wrong. I don't care if it's my brother, my sister, cousin, any uncle. I don't condone nothing wrong. So if if you, if some, I just want to, look, if somebody in my family do something wrong to you, don't say, oh, yeah, well, this, yeah, uh, you, you need to talk. Well, no, if you knew something was wrong and you didn't do something about it, that's between you and God. The, the scripture says, speak that which you know. I can't be responsible for what people are related to me or people that know me do. I'm responsible for me. What did I do? If somebody done you wrong, you deal with them. That don't have nothing to do with me. I don't condone nothing or with nobody that do wrong. So if somebody do you wrong and they know me or they related to me, don't try to spare them on my behalf. No, you do what's right, regardless of what the circumstances are. You do what's right, because I know I, I get that sometimes. People bring up people that's related to me or that know me. They bring up something that they done. Well, deal with them. It ain't me that did it to you. So I just wanted to clarify that, because folk just say all kind of stuff these days. But nevertheless, you know, I just wanted to tell you, you know, hey, look, it's time for us to, you know, you got to be awakened. And don't be so, well, I can't say that because it's just not true. You're going to be offended. And if the truth is being preached to you, if the truth is being preached to you, the 100% truth eventually is going to hit us all, even me. I'm not exempt from the truth because there are some there are some areas I'm wrong. There are things that I got to work on. None of us have gotten to a point where we made it. We still have faults and failures and Satan still exists and he's going to stay on his job and Satan's going to find things that he knows is going to get to us rather if it be in our feelings or rather if it be physically something we like, anything he can to try to pull us away from God. So, you know, nevertheless, we want to pray and uh, do the best we can to turn away. Once we caught up, repent, and get up and do better. And that's about the best thing I can really say on stuff like that. I'm not perfect. I don't try to be one thing that I do try to be is honest and real because I really want God to work with me and deal with me and don't take his spirit from me. So nevertheless, that's all I want to say. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get out, but I my, my night a little short. Um, but anywho, I bless you all, and I hope you all have a good night. I want to end this with a prayer. Lord, in the name of Jesus, touch those under the sound of my voice. Uh, those that may be going through hardship and pain and going through things that are not to their understanding. But, but Lord, let them know to depend on you and to trust you to see them through. Lord, there may be difficult things that we deal with and we're going to deal with. But, Lord, we know that our faith and trust is in you. And, Lord, help and give us strength to hold on, to be able to endure it to the end. Because, God, we know that if we endure it to the end, that the greater is later. Lord, be with us, guide us, and keep us safe. Lord, 
Bless those that are sick. Bless those that are in the prisons. Uh, Lord, bless uh, those who are hungry. Bless those that are less fortunate. Lord, because you know that we you, you're with us even in the lowest parts, God, you're with us. And we're going to be careful to keep giving you the praise, the glory, and the honor. And the mighty name of Jesus Christ that I do pray, amen. God bless you all.